Okay, excellent. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Putting Your Best Foot Forward with Carrie Cook. My name is Brienne LeClaire. I work in client services here with Parkinson's Association of Alberta, and I will be the moderator for this webinar. So if you have any questions during the webinar, please submit them in the chat below. At the bottom of your screen, there's a little chat blurb icon. You click it and the chat will appear on your screen. And you can send your questions out to the whole group or just to us as the panelists with the drop down arrow there. So a quick disclaimer, this webinar will be recorded. All information provided in videos by Parkinson's Association and the featured speaker is furnished strictly for educational and entertainment purposes only. This service is not intended to be diagnostic, prescriptive, or replace the relationship advice and or care of your physician. So general questions about symptoms, treatments, available medications, complementary and alternative healthcare therapies, and current research will be fielded. So I'd like to welcome Carrie Cook here to start us off and to introduce herself here briefly. All right, thanks, Bree. So for those of you that I haven't met, um, my name is Carrie Cook. I'm a physiotherapist. I cannot see who is in the webinar at the moment. Um, some of you I may have met over the years. I've been consulting with Parkinson Association for probably 10 years now. Um, so you may have seen me talk before or seen me in exercise classes or, or something like that. Um, I've been a physiotherapist in the healthcare um, world for about 28 years now. The last 17 of which have been almost all in Parkinson's disease at the Movement Disorders Clinic. Um, I was a deep brain stimulation coordinator for about six years. I did some research um, assisting with um, some of their projects that they were doing. I was a physiotherapist with them doing um, education. And my favorite things to work on are walking and balance. And so feet relate to both of those activities extremely well. So when Brandy asked me to do a, an in-service, I had just finished doing a shoe in-service for the adult day program at the Sturgeon Hospital, which is where I'm currently working, in addition to consulting some Wednesday afternoons at Parkinson Association. So um, what, you're, what you put on your feet is super important, as we'll talk about in the in-service. So I thought, I think this group might learn, um, you know, what, what they might need to do for their feet as well. So hopefully you find it as interesting as I do. I love talking about shoes and feet. So without further ado, we'll commence. Apologies if you hear any noise in the background. I'm having a deck built at my house. So I hear some distracting hammering, but hopefully you guys don't. So the objectives for today's talk, I wanted to just go over a couple of fun foot facts with some numbers, just because that's always an interesting way to get the brain engaged. I wanted to talk about some footwear options that are maybe safer than others and some new and exciting things that have come out on the market recently. Um, I wanted to talk about what the role of the foot in walking is. Um, and that's kind of a pun there. And then, you know, specific to Parkinson's disease, quite a few people end up with what is called a foot dystonia. And we'll talk about what that is and what we might do if that does happen to you. And of course, at the end, uh, I'd love some good questions. And more than that, let's talk about our experiences with what has worked for you. Uh, share our collective wisdom about shoes and walking and uh, what the good choices are. So... That being said, a couple of fun facts. The average person who is moderately active takes about 7,500 steps per day. You may have heard, you know, the 10,000 steps a day thrown around. I think that uh, has been kind of um, put out there as a marker to improve and try to encourage people to walk more. Um, if you maintain that daily average, and you live until about the age of 80, you will have walked 200 million steps in your lifetime, if I'm reading that right. 216 million steps, that's a lot of pounding on those poor feet. So again, why it's so important to take care of them. 
And then in about 2016, there was a study that came out that said, you know, sometimes these numbers, 7,500 and 10,000 steps a day is not realistic. What is kind of the minimum step goal for somebody who has Parkinson's? And they came up with trying to meet the 150 minutes of exercise per week guidelines that Canada Fitness Guidelines has for all of us and turned it into, um, for, for person with Parkinson's, they decided 4,200 steps a day might be able to meet the requirement uh, and be more realistic for people who might have other problems as well. Like if you have arthritis or uh, you have uh, had a stroke in the past as well as Parkinson's. So 4,200 steps might be something to target for. But of course, when I meet with people on a one-to-one -one basis, I just double check with them. Like if they wear a, a step counter of any kind or they keep their phone on them, it keeps track of their steps just to kind of see what they're doing on a daily basis. And then wherever you're at, whether that's 2,000 steps a day, 3,000, just trying to maybe increase that each week a little bit. You know, just trying to be realistic about maybe a 10% increase and just go from there over time. And maybe you can hit some of these target numbers. And then the other fun fact is, um, that about 30 to 40% of people with Parkinson's do experience a foot dystonia. And that can be in the form of your toes kind of, kind of curling or clawing up a little bit like that as you're walking. Or for some people, a little bit more of a foot turning in so that you're kind of landing on the outside of your foot as you walk. And that might be painful. It might not be painful. It might be bothersome and it might not be. Um, so that's a fun fact for that. So anything that is said today, if you're not clear about what I meant, please feel free to ask a question or to uh, follow up with some further information. As my cartoon says, sometimes we misinterpret people's advice. My doctor told me to walk five days a week. The other two days, I guess you're supposed to carry me. I like that one. Okay, so just typical foot problems for humans in general. Um, you might all have experienced uh, or seen these before. So there's an arch on the um, inside of our foot that sometimes collapses down and people will call that flat feet. And in this case, you can almost see the bones there. And if you, you kind of walk landing on those bones, that can be quite painful. And then there's other problems with the feet like hammer toes where the toes uh, stick up. And so you might need a bigger toe box in your shoe to accommodate that. And also very common, I myself have this one, the dropped met head, which is where the base of your toes kind of fall down. There's supposed to be an arch or a bridge that goes across your foot. And if those bones fall down, it kind of feels like you're walking on marbles and it can be quite painful. So there's two different bridges or arches in the foot. And there's lots of different bones that connect all together to make it, the foot all work so that you can accommodate when you, your foot hits the ground, you know, when you hit a rock and you can adjust and, or you can walk on an incline. There's all sorts of bones in there that accommodate for us to be able to do what we need to do. So jumping right into footwear options. Uh, keep calm and put your shoes on. What kind of shoes are the best? So I've been around long enough that when I first joined uh, treating people with Parkinson's, the prevailing advice at that time was to suggest dress shoes, actually. Because of the freezing of the feet and the sticking of the feet, they felt that um, a dress shoe sh sole of the dress shoe was a little bit more less grippy than a runner and that people could walk a little bit better in those. Now, again, this being maybe 20 years ago, not as many people were wearing running shoes. More people had spent their working life in a dress shoe. Um, and so this wasn't a, a strange uh, recommendation. People were happy to keep wearing their dress shoes. I would say that that's changed over the years quite dramatically to now. Almost every client I see comes in wearing a form of a runner. And of course, with um, treatments like 
LSBT big and power. It is more about how we lift the foot up and how we move it, um, to get the feet unstuck from the floor. So wearing the grippy sole isn't quite um, seen as a negative anymore. Um, and of course, we've made some advances in some fun things like we have elastic shoelaces that you don't have to bend over and tie up your shoes all the time. You can just adjust the elastic and slip your foot in. And those are kind of uh, an easy adaptation um, to make, or there's shoes that have no laces at all that are just designed to slip in. And sometimes using a long handled shoehorn or something like that might help you assist to get your foot in, but they're still quite conforming to the foot. They're not loose or sloppy. You know, they're still giving you a lot of support. Um, and then there's a really modified or adaptive shoe. If you're really having a hard time getting your feet in, or you have a lot of deformities on the tops of your feet, again, those uh, hammer toes and things like that, where this shoe, the whole flap comes off and you can easily put your foot in and just fold the flap over with Velcro. So that's a, another option. Um, really good website that everybody has access to is findingbalancealberta.ca. They have lots of great education on falls and balance, but they also of course have a foot section because it's so um, uh, important. So there are tips for taking care of your feet, you know, pretty common sense, uh, wearing proper footwear to prevent falls, healthy feet and pain-free fee, pain feet can help you keep your balance, proper foot care, like getting somebody to actually clip your nails for you or going to a place that takes care of your nails, use warm water to wash your feet, dry completely in between the toes, especially if you have diabetes, it's very important to make sure that you're not um, developing any sores in there. Get your nails trimmed straight across and not too short. When you're sitting, you can put your feet up on a stool to decrease any swelling that you get around the ankle. And check your feet often for things like corns, open sores, redness, dry skin, thickened nails. If, if you don't have somebody who can help you with your feet, you might need a mirror, a long handled mirror to check underneath and see what's going on under there. If you have decreased sensation, things like neuropathy or uh, diabetic neuropathy, you might not feel that rock in the shoe that has started to wear down and create a, a wound. So you might need that mirror to check. And there are tips for proper footwear, of course, some people hit a stage where it is more dangerous to walk in their sock feet in the house. There's not enough grip provided. And so they do recommend wearing footwear or shoes inside your house as well as outside. And if you have to wear an ankle brace, like an AFO or something like that, you need that inside of a shoe anyways. So some people just get used to wearing their shoes inside the house. Uh, perhaps like they do in the US. Um, it says to avoid walking in bare feet, stockings, or floppy slippers with an open heel. So I definitely agree to avoid walking in stockings. They're way too slippery. The floppy slippers are a chronic problem that we all seem to have. And we need to come up with some better options for slippers in the house that actually have a, a heel support uh, so that it stays on your foot. Now the walking in bare feet is a little controversial because there is some research that talks about how our balance is, you know, 15% better when we're in bare feet than when we are actually wearing shoes. Now for some of us, if we have good sensation in our feet, um, we might be able to use the sensation on the bottom of our feet to tell us, you know, how we're connecting with the ground and what our balance is. We can also use those toes to grip in for better balance. So sometimes bare feet, I'm kind of of two minds. Sometimes I think it's not a good a piece of advice to uh, walk in bare feet. And for some people you can. So it just depends on what's happening with your particular feet and your balance. 
It says to wear shoes that allow for room for your feet to swell. That is also a common problem for people. Buy shoes with laces or Velcro closures with a snug fit and wear shoes with a non-slip tread. Um, I did have a client recently fall because she was getting ready for an appointment that day and she was just wearing her socks, no shoes or grippy socks, and her legs started to do this as she bent over to reach underneath the counter and poof, the feet completely slipped apart. So just always being aware of what surface you're on, whether it's carpet or hardwood and what's on your feet in connection with that. Uh, sock feet on carpet might have been okay. Sock feet on linoleum, not as good, right? Okay, so they also have a, a picture on the Finding Balance um, Alberta.ca about what is an ideal shoe. So we'll just talk about the different parts of a shoe. Um, the back side, you know, they're suggesting a heel being a quarter inch to one inch high. Uh, it is a bugbear of mine when clients show up with a wedge heel or anything higher than a half an inch, um, and they have some balance impairment because that, um, that heel making contact with the floor puts them at a increased angle. Um, now they might have been used to wearing a high heel their entire life and they might have perfectly good balance in that heel. But I do find that as people get older and they have a comorbidities kind of stacking up, it really does become a little bit more dangerous to walk in any sort of a heel at all. Um, and the front toe area, I don't think people pay enough attention to how wide their feet become over time. I can tell you myself, as a teenager, I wore a size seven. And of course, as I aged and had children and my ligaments got laxer and I perhaps gained more weight, the feet do widen over time. So now I am definitely an eight and a half, sometimes a nine, depending on the width of the shoe. So making sure that, you know, if you have bunions, you need to accommodate um, that your toes are never feeling painfully squished. When you try on a new pair of shoes, it should almost feel like, oh my goodness, I'm walking on a cloud. Like it should feel that comfortable right as you put it on. You can't wait for it to start to feel good or for it to stretch out. That never works. Um, I think that's about it for the ideal shoe. Move on here. So um, when I gave this in service a while back, it was springtime and we were just getting into thinking about hotter weather. And it is also a problem when people show up in flip-flops who have gait issues or balance issues, um, because there's very strange things that we do when we're wearing flip-flops. Like we almost shuffle our feet on the floor and don't actually pick them up and lift them. And so that's a, a bit of a, problem when you're already trying to fight um, a frozen or a shuffling gait. You don't want your footwear to be encouraging that. So these are examples of good summer footwear that I think um, because they have the back heel strap or support, you're getting a good contact with your whole foot. Uh, the gentleman's sandal there on the right has really good toe coverage. So if you happen to drop for example, your cane on your toe, sometimes when that handle falls, it can be quite painful. So covered toes is a little safer. The lady on the, the left there likes to show off her pedicure, which is fine. But just so, so you know, your toes have no coverage. But those are examples of sandals, which would be much more appropriate than a flip-flop. And then of course, here in Alberta, we deal with a lot of winter weather. So as we approach the fall here, I want you to think about what kind of boots you typically wear out and about in the winter time. Check the bottoms of your boots that you've had for a few years and make sure that the grips are still good. I personally ended up falling on the ice one year and wondered why, because I'd been wearing my good winter boots, I thought, until I looked at the bottom and realized that the tread was almost completely worn off. And when I did the math, I'd actually had these boots for 15 years, but I hadn't really noticed it. You know, I hadn't thought about it. Time 
supplies and, and you kind of forget about these things. Every year you just pick out your favorite boots and away you go. So this, this fall, take a look at your boots, check the treads. If you need extra support, if you're a, somebody who likes walking outside, regardless of the weather, of course, we have these slip-on spikes on the left-hand side, which go on top of your existing uh, hikers or winter boots. They are a little tricky to, to get on correctly, and they can only be worn on certain surfaces. So they work really great on snow-packed trails or ice. They don't feel as good when you're walking on pure cement and they're really terrible if you try to walk on ceramic tile or inside you'll slide all over the place with these spikes or you'll damage your floors one of the two so those have to be taken on and off depending on you know where you are the newer advancement and i haven't been able to try this one myself is the um, boot on the right hand side um I can't even remember the name of these, but I was going to suss them out this year and try them. So they actually have like built in spikes. So what you're seeing there is these red pieces fit onto the bottom of the boot with the spikes not showing. They go into the boot when you don't need them. Then when it's icy and snowy and you want to have your spikes, you just take your shoe, turn that around and the spikes will face the other way once you lay them flat. So you don't have to carry these spikes in your pocket or uh, find them in your closet. They're always there attached to your boot. And I've had a couple of other coworkers say that, that they work really well, but again, I haven't tried them myself. So later in the discussion time, if anybody has actually tried these, that would be very interesting to hear about. Now, now some of us do use a cane or walking poles or a walker to walk with. Um, and I think I want you to think of those as kind of being your extra feet. So if a, a cat has really good balance and they can, they never seem to fall. I never see my cat just walking and just tipping over for no reason. They have four good feet. I like to think of the hiking poles and your own feet as four feelers and four good points of stability. Um, and also your walker has four wheels and you have two feet, so you have six feet. So it does provide you better balance and putting your body weight through these devices with your arms actually decreases some pressure on your feet, your knees and your hips and even a little, little bit offloads your lower back, but does put a bit more of the stress and strain on your wrists, your elbows and your shoulders and your neck. So you're just sort of redistributing your body weight in some ways by using these um, feet. Uh, the poles, um, some of you may have seen uh, the poles that we use at the Buchanan Center, where you can take the rubber tips off if, um, if it's snowy and icy, and it has a steel, carbide tip built into the bottom like a, a traditional hiking pole if you're in the mountains or and then if you're in urban centers where you're walking mostly on sidewalks it has a rubber uh, big round bell shaped tip for some of them or a little booty tip so you can be in different terrains by taking the tips on and off kind of like how you would change your footwear for different terrains Okay, let's talk about the role of the foot in walking. So typically, I don't want to overemphasize this too much because the human body is very efficient. It just tries to pick up your toes just as much as it absolutely needs to to clear and then sort of land on the back of your foot and roll forward onto your toes. It's not an exaggerated, you know, it's not super big heel to toe. Um, our body is very efficient at determining just the right amount of clearance. And that's why sometimes we end up sort of tripping on our toes or catching our toes on things like a stair or a curb um, is because our body's trying to just do the bare minimum for us to make us more efficient, but doesn't make us safe always. So sometimes we have to really pick up the toes a little bit more, um, but it is typically a heel to toe pattern. And what happens in Parkinson's disease often is that um, people will start walking a little bit more flat footed. So you'll see the whole foot land or you'll actually see them land on the forefoot. 
and then lower the heel down. And those are both kind of strategies that the body is very smart. It's trying to help you with balance. It's trying to help you with the stiffness that's happening in your ankle and your knees and your hips. So it's changing how you walk based on what is happening in your body. And so it's trying to help you, but in the long run, that type of walking tends to lead to further problems down the road. So we do try, you know, at, at our newly diagnosed clients, um, trying to teach them this heel to toe pattern and trying to keep that for as long as you can, because that is actually uh, a way that you can work through some of the stiffness or rigidity of the muscles that happens in the lower leg and in your spine. And it keeps your balance a little bit more where it needs to be uh, rather than backwards. If you land on your flat foot or on the front of your foot, you might be kind of perched backwards a little bit too much. We actually want that leg to go over top of your toes. We'll have another slide that addresses that. So this rocker, we used to talk about the foot rocker a lot. And then eventually they came up with running shoes that kind of helped you rock from the heel to the toe. And we thought that was going to be just fantastic. However, it didn't really um, help that much. And people found the heel, the size of the thickness of the heel to be quite awkward. So that kind of fell out of, of fashion. But we still talk about the foot being a slight bit of a rocker, and it does become difficult to do that when you have a lot of arthritis in your toes. Um, if you have a, 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 what am I trying to say, a bunion on your toe, that big toe doesn't like to extend, and you kind of need that for push off um, when you're walking. So, and it also doesn't really like to bend too much. So it kind of likes just to stay stuck in the middle. And you might have to work on some things to keep the um, mobility and the agility of your foot as things change over time. And then as we'll talk at the end, there can be changes in what we call tone, which is just your muscles resting status. So if you have lots of tone, your muscles are very active. And if you have low tone, your muscles are very flaccid or flat. Um, so what I like to tell people to do is that we should actually practice sort of this motion from heel to toe with our foot. And we can do that in sitting in the chair. Um, I don't have a video of the sitting, but it's just as easily done, you know, sticking your, your leg out a little bit, landing on the heel, pushing down through that heel, rolling your foot forward and trying to push off through the toes a little bit and just see how stiff is my foot today. And usually in the morning, you might wake up with quite a stiff foot or ankle. And then as you get going throughout your day, oh, there we go. Okay, as you get going throughout your day, um, it will loosen up and it will feel better. So this is an ex example of a gentleman who is practicing this heel to toe exercise. Now he's not doing it with a chairs or poles or anything to hold on to because his balance is pretty good. He's really just doing this for foot flexibility and for weight shifting his body back and forth and just practicing that motion of getting the lower leg to go over the front of the foot. But if you have balance problems, of course, you can do this hanging onto a kitchen counter or your walker or whatever you need to hold onto to be safe, but to get that foot mobilizing. And again, you can do it in sitting in a chair. So you can, I just thought it was a good video to kind of see all the different ways that he's trying to mimic some of the things that happen when we're actually walking to make sure his foot is flexible. So if anybody has any questions about that, you know, put, go ahead and put that in the chat box below. And I can't see my presentation anymore. Share my screen. Hmm. Is it going to go back to this one? Let's see. Yeah, we can How's see this. So we can see the slides, but we can see the presenter view. So I okay. have to right click to change that over again, and we should be good to go. <laughs> Are you changing it or am I changing I it? I think you'll have to change it. Uh, okay, hold on. Let me see if I can just click a different one here. Okay, how's that? Perfect. That's perfect. <laughs> okay, and I want to go back to 
that's what I want to see though. Hold on one second. There we go. Okay, I think we're good now. Perfect. So we saw the video. So this again, just another little uh, quick thing about what happens normally to the foot. So we land sort of on that heel, then the foot flattens down, the lower leg goes over top of the toes. And then we kind of, as we transition our weight forward, then we end up on the very front of the foot and the toes and we kind of toe push off. Um, what doesn't happen in Parkinson's disease often is that calf muscle kind of stays on all the time. So it's hard for you to land on your heel and lower the toes down if your calf muscle is pulling. And then it's hard for you to get a good push off on your toes if your calf muscle is already contracted. It's hard to tell it to contract more to do that push off. So one of the things that happens is that muscle tightness or rigidity or that tone in the calf muscle that just kind of stays on all the time makes it hard for people to jump. It makes it hard for them to do a calf raise. It makes it hard for them to do this very quick cyclical on, off, on, off when they're walking. So a couple of things we work on in physio sometimes is we'll get, we'll practice jumping, we'll practice um, calf raises, and we'll stretch out the foot just to see if we can kind of get that calf muscle to relax and to get this proper walking pattern back into play. So we watched the video. Let's go on quickly to dystonia here. Um, so foot dystonia, um, I'm not sure if anybody who's listening today has it or has had a little bit of it. You might, this is quite an extreme picture I chose just to give you a real idea of what it looks like. Um, if the toes are curling down and you're not telling them to, if the, if the foot is turning in like that and, and you're not telling them to, that's a dystonia. And it comes along sometimes when your medication is off in your body and there's not enough levodopa and it can happen regardless of what stage of the levodopa is at. So dystonia is a little bit puzzling that way. Sometimes changing the medications will help this problem and sometimes the medication is not part of the equation. So uh, management over the years that we've tried with different clients, again, changing the levodopa schedule or the dosing may or may not help. Sometimes we've tried changing to different shoes or different foot orthotics, the inserts that you put inside your shoe. If you have a really good connection there can help the foot to relax and not have as much tone in it. And sometimes people have even tried different types of braces. I have to say that that hasn't been as successful, depending on what you're trying to do. So maybe for a brief period of time, like let's say you wanted to just do a, a couple hours of golf and you really needed that foot to be stable and sort of held in one spot, the brace might help you for that. Um, but it wouldn't be something that maybe you wear all the time. Um, clients have told me that the foot roller that you see in the picture there has helped reduce their foot tone when they feel the cramping coming on extra strong. It's too much. They can take their shoe off and sit and they can roller that foot out for a few minutes and then it, it helps to reduce the tone. There are certainly some stretches so that over time your foot doesn't get stuck and contracted in that position. And also very successfully um, Botox injections from your uh, experienced neurologist. They can inject the toes so that they don't curl too much or the whole uh, part of the foot that turns in. They just have to start off at a, a low dose and work their way up to see what works because we actually do need that foot to grip the ground for balance. And we do need those foot muscles to help lift and navigate walking so they can't Botox is a poison from fish that uh, paralyzes muscles. So you can't inject a, a lot of Botox at the beginning because you don't want to paralyze the entire foot. You just want to stop the excessive toe contractions or the foot contractions. So they do start low and they work their way up and see if they can help. And, and a lot of clients have found Botox to be quite helpful for the, the foot dystonia. 
Um, oh my goodness, I talk fast. I we're already here at question and answers. And if anybody has any comments about shoes or feet or dystonia or walking or any experiences they've had with really great shoes and where to get them, let, let's share our knowledge. Excellent. Uh, we'll give them here a second. I got one here asking about the Botox. Um, mm. If Botox for foot dystonia is covered by the Alberta Health care or if that's something people have to pay out of pocket that's a great question and i wish charlene the nurse was here to answer <laughs> that for me uh, because they used to help with botox clinic all the time i believe it's like any other medication that your doctor might prescribe for you that that there might be a portion you have to pay um, depending on the coverage that you have. Now, certainly the doctor doesn't charge a fee to inject it. That's covered by Alberta okay. Health. So the doctor's time and in the injecting is covered. You just need to have a neurologist who's knowledgeable to mm. do it. But I think the cost of the Botox is like every other medication. You okay. have to do your so share. there's some cost. I do think that depending on insurance case. and yeah, uh, but again, um, if if you have a neurologist that you see and you think this might be for you, they can certainly answer all those okay. questions. Excellent. Um, so yeah, the chat is at the bottom there and you can type into the chat um, your questions. Um, with the like feet and kind of the foot health, does the flooring impact kind of the foot health, the like fall prevention oh, or footwear? Goodness. If you have lots of like tile or carpet, does that make a difference in what kind of footwear you might want to wear in and around your home? That's a very good question, Bree. Um, so I have had clients who have switched out all of their carpet to a more smooth surface, like a uh, laminate or a hardwood because um, it's easier to not have transitions in your house. So if you have a lot of carpet to lino, lino to carpet, and you're walking, those can kind of trip you up a little bit. And for people who are freezers, those transitions can be particularly tricky to get over. So there is, um, there used to be a Canadian tax credit where if you had to do some renovations to your house so I've had people ask about that in the past about switching out the flooring mm -hmm. um, I do think for some people carpet is great because if you're a frequent faller it's softer to land on um, I do think the smooth surfaces for things like using a walker or um, not getting your feet stuck like all the hospitals that I work in or the clinics, they all have very smooth flooring. So people walk better when they come to clinic than they do at home because they might have the thick carpet or the transitions and things like that. So I think there's a reason hospitals, besides disinfection, it's, it is an easier uh, flooring to walk on. And also mm -hmm. laminate is great because you can put chalk on it and you can draw lines and help people step better and you can... Um, you can do different things with tape on, uh, you know, whereas carpet is a little bit harder. You can't really paint, you know, have you ever seen where people will paint 3D stairs because people can sometimes do stairs better than they can walk straight ahead in Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. So the 3D stuff in the painting is easier on smooth surfaces. But in terms of foot health, I would just say in general, ceramic tile is really hard on feet. It's a mm -hmm. very not forgiving surface. So if you're somebody who cooks in the kitchen and stands on your feet a lot, that that um, I get a lot of complaints about that. So people needing to wear really supportive slippers or footwear if they have ceramic tile. Mm -hmm. And all the other ones are a little more forgiving and cushioning. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah, that tile, it's, it's hard. It doesn't forgive anything. <laughs> no, hips and backs and feet do <laughs> not like ceramic tile. Ah. Uh -huh. It's for freezing. Is there footwear that's better for people that experience freezing with their Parkinson's than other footwear? I haven't had clients tell me about particular footwear. Usually the freezing happens more situationally. 
um, and they have strategies that help them with the freezing that are non-footwear related typically. Okay. So um, sometimes shifting your weight right to left to offload and then try to take the step sometimes um, imagining an obstacle to step over gets you out of the freeze sometimes just taking a deep breath and standing really tall and getting your body weight back on top of your feet if your weight is at all forward um, you're going to kind of be stuck in that really tight calf muscle situation so no I haven't noticed mm -hmm. footwear particularly but again back historically they would have said oh if you're a freezer wear a dress shoe but again, that oh. had some implications about slipperiness and stuff. So nowadays, what we think about really just lifting that leg and using our cognitive movement strategies more so than relying on the footwear to do it for us. Mm. Yeah. Um, the ones that they enjoy, they have this rocker shoe they found in walking outdoors because it kind of helps them like rock okay. forward and how the sole is built. And so it kind of it's built it sounds up. like it's built up and then it's kind of rounded yes and that that was a beneficial shoe for in them. kind of walking and hiking and that's awesome I, I think I did mention it in the in-service I didn't have a picture of it but the, those um I've had different clients try them and some people really do love them and some people don't so it's very individual about whether it helps you in your walking pattern. So, but it's certainly something to try if you think that if that's an issue for you is not getting that proper rocking motion. I find the thickness of the shoe of those to be almost like too unstable. Like they're really mm. thick for some people. And if you have any sort of nerve sensation loss in your feet and you can't feel your feet very well to begin with, adding that thickness can be problematic for some people, but again, other people love them. So um, I would suggest going to a really good shoe store and trying those on before you purchase and see if that works for you. And, that, and then I've got one here. The um, shoes that you had there, the picture of where they opened up, yeah. you didn't have laces or anything. Where can people find those? Are those something that's available in a shoe store or yeah, special I order? I don't know where I found that photo, but I'll try to look on the internet about where I think it was a generic website talking about adaptive shoes, mm -hmm. but I think some really good shoes, adaptive shoe stores. I have a list that Alberta Health has put together of the recommended shoe stores in the Edmonton area. Now you guys okay. may be from somewhere else in Alberta. Um, but I can forward that list of recommended shoe okay. stores to you, Brie, and then yeah. you can disseminate that. That would be excellent. So I'm sure some of them probably have probably Calgary and Edmonton stores and that. And I think looks like we got a good split. There's some people in Calgary, some people in Edmonton that are in attendance. Okay. So hopefully they're close to a store. Yeah, we might be out of luck down here in some of the further out rural regions for right. stores like that, but that's okay. <laughs> and a trip to Calgary or Edmonton to get these really cool shoes or nowadays almost anything can be ordered off the internet. Mm. So, but now you know that they exist, you can look for them online and, and in the stores and call. So mm. just throwing out a couple of names, Soul Experience in, in Edmonton carries some interesting shoes. Uh, Kunitz shoes um, also carry some different types of shoes. And the list that I'm going to send you brief, there's a few others in yeah. the area. Yeah. And do things like Alberta Aids to Daily Living or like insurance help cover special shoes? Uh, I think they do. Yes, there are certain um, coverages depending on the foot deformity. Now, in my Parkinson's clients, they don't typically tend to be that um, mm. severe so that they would mm. actually qualify for those. But certainly if your doctor writes a note saying that this type of shoe is medically necessary, then they'll most cover most things. Okay. Um, but insoles and braces have their own coverage spectrum as well. well okay. So Excellent. the places that provide the insoles, like they make the insoles and the braces, they could tell you what the coverages are. Fantastic. That's all the questions I got uh, directly to me here in the chat. So 
Was there any last minute ones? I don't see anything. Well, thank you, Carrie, so much. This was very informative and such wonderful information. And we really enjoyed our time together here today. Thank you. You're so welcome. Thank you well, for coming out. And <laughs> thanks for having me and keep walking, guys. Excellent. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming out. And uh, it's been uh, lovely to have you all here. Hopefully we'll see you at uh, one of our next webinars or at Step and Stride coming up here in September. <laughs>